Thank you, everybody. I, I, uh, I wrote a short paper that, uh, and did not write a, a PowerPoint presentation. I thought the paper would be uh, available for people to look at, but that's all right. I can just talk. And uh, you, can, you can all listen, and I'll try to keep everybody awake. Uh, now, the, the title of this, uh, of this paper is uh, Notes on Modeling Labor Markets and the Effects of Labor Market Policies. And this reflects uh, something that goes back to the time when I was first a graduate student, had the opportunity to spend a year in Kenya at the Institute for Development Studies at the Uni University of Nairobi. And I got there, and it was the first time that I had been out of the United States except for uh, going to Canada. And I was really struck by what it was like to be in a developing country, uh, uh, in a very foreign continent, uh, Kenya seven years post-independence, and uh, the number of issues that were being faced. I also found that a group of people had preceded me. The Rockefeller Foundation had picked Kenya as a, uh, a pet country for development purposes. And they had funded visits by people like Stiglitz and Diamond and later uh, Tobin and uh, Nick Stern and uh, George Johnson, who was my PhD advisor. And I discovered as well in the collection of working papers around the place uh, that those people and a couple of young guys named Harrison Todaro had working papers that very much influenced me in terms of my way of thinking. So the, uh, what it set off a uh, uh, work on what I think of as two big questions. And these two big questions have guided the research I've been doing over my career and uh, I'll be talking to you about today. First is the big question of who benefits from he economic growth, who is hurt how much by economic decline. It seemed to me that economic development was about improving people's material standards of living. And it raises a question about which people and uh, how we measure their standards of living. I was particularly concerned about the poor and about working people and whether, as economic growth took place, they were achieving higher incomes and fuller employment or not. And that, in turn, leads to the second question. <coughs> Excuse me. How do developing countries' labor markets work? Uh, how do we understand uh, what determines labor market conditions, how labor market conditions would change if various policies were to be put into effect? And so those two questions about when economic growth takes place, who benefits, and what is the role of the labor market in transmitting economic growth to people, and how do labor markets work are the questions I've been working on for a long, long time. Now, uh, in, in getting into this field and continuing to work on it, I found that there were four papers that actually are fundamental to the way of thinking I want to describe to you today. The, what I want to describe to you today is about multi-sector labor market modeling. It's not just simply representative agent. It's not just simply a one-sector model. More than one sector uh, where these sectors interrelate with each other in ways uh, I'll be talking about. So the earliest paper I found relevant to this was the work of Arthur Lewis, for which he won the Nobel Prize. And his, as uh, probably everybody in this room knows, is a two-sector model with a capitalist sector, a subsistence sector. From the point of view of the labor market, everybody wants to work in the capitalist sector because it pays better and offers higher utility, but only some fraction of people can. And so those who don't, in the Lewis model, uh, took up jobs in what he called the subsistence sector of the economy. Not that they were happy there, not that they had freely chosen it, but, but they chose it in preference to being unemployed and earning nothing. Uh, Faye and Rainus amplified on that way of looking at things. Uh, and uh, the model had two sectors, no unemployment. Simon Kuznets, in his famous paper on economic inequality uh, uh, and economic development, had 
two-sector model, an urban sector, a rural sector, income inequality within each one, and a reallocation of labor from the rural sector to the urban sector. And the question was, how does income inequality evolve in the course of that economic growth? And of course, leads to Cousins' inverted U pattern. Uh, which formulated then a basis for uh, 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 what we might find empirically. Third paper that I found extremely influential is the harris todaro model. Harris and Todaro's model won a prize. Uh, uh, the American Economic Association commissioned Dan McFadden, Bob Solo, and a number, of, a number of other people to identify the 20 best papers published in uh, the first 100 years of the American Economic Review. Harris and Todaro's paper was one of them. And Harris and Todaro, I thought, had two insights I found brilliant. And I mean that seriously. The first was that, uh, the, uh, that an increase in urban employment would make urban unemployment worse, not better. And the second conclusion he had, they had, was that the solution to urban unemployment was rural development. Only two-sector modeling could lead to those two conclusions. And I thought, that's really, that really is brilliant. I, I mean that. And then uh, the fourth work paper that, uh, that I discovered was a paper by Joe Stiglitz in which he was developing efficiency wage theory and using it to understand why wages in the, uh, the high wage part of the Kenyan economy and in other countries' economies were set the way they were that it was in the profit max might be in the profit maximizing interests of firms to pay higher wages. So these then set the stage for the kind of work that I wanted to do. So what was the kind of work I wanted to do? It was to say that uh, these sorts of multi-sector models, if we are careful about specifying how each of the components works and how the components are linked to each other, could help inform us in a very important way of how things operate at present, and secondly, how uh, things, how conditions might change if various policies were put into effect. So starting with my doctoral dissertation and going on over many, many years, I continued on and off to work in, in these areas and to try to develop um, these models further. Now, the models have a number of features in common. And that is multiple sectors, careful specification of how each of the sectors works and how the sectors are linked to each other. For example, by people who don't get jobs in one sector moving into the other one, by people choosing among search strategies so as to maximize the expected wages ex ante before dis dis discovering who gets jobs and who doesn't get jobs. Those are alternative specifications, and they are important ones. So in formulating a, a, a framework, the framework is constantly going back and forth in modeling from what we observe empirically to what, how we capture and stylize these factors theoretically, and then going back to further empirical analysis. Of the papers we heard yesterday, the one that Chris presented, Chris and co-authors, was closest to this style of modeling. And I want to elaborate, it, elaborate on it further in my remarks this morning. So, the, the framework for doing the analysis has five steps. First is to specify, uh, uh, that is, for policy analysis purposes, specify what is the policy instrument, what is the policy action under consideration. The second is to write down the model and how the model works in terms of a parsimonious specification of key relationships. These specifications are driven partly by theory and partly by empirical observation. The third step, step is to use the model to analyze 
what are the predicted outcomes of the policy variable under consideration. The fourth step is to be explicit about what are the welfare criteria to be used in evaluating policies. And then the fifth step is to apply these welfare criteria to the predicted outcomes to determine whether things would be getting better or things would be getting worse as a consequence of the policies under consideration. Taking that as the basis of, anal of the analysis then, uh, what it would do would be to force the analyst to try to say, here, how, here are how the pieces fit together, here are my welfare judgments, and here is how I'm going to evaluate what the outcomes are going to be. Much of the time, I find that we economists don't do that, that we don't specify a, a particular model, that we don't specify, here are the welfare criteria I am using. And here, then, is why this particular policy intervention would make things better or make things worse. So that kind of modeling, I believe, to be important, to be fundamental to the, the task before us, is to come up with the best analytical understanding we can of how things work and um, what, how, how, how those conditions would change. Many of these models involve sectors that are geographically distinct, which is very much the theme of this conference. So how do rural labor markets work? How do urban labor markets work? How do the rural-urban connections work? And that, in turn, led to an understanding that sometimes generic models designed to fit a particular place and a particular set of conditions could be broadly applicable to other places and other conditions. And sometimes new models need to be formulated because of country specifics that make a huge difference. And I'll talk about those in what I'm about to develop now. Let me start with the harris todaro model and elaborations on it. What the harris todaro model did was that it said, we're going to judge whether the policies that we're considering are going to help uh, improve labor market conditions or not on the basis of the unemployment rate in the economy. So that's the welfare criterion Harris and Todaro used. What they did is that they said there's a high wage part of the economy uh, and a low wage part of the economy. Everybody would like to work in the high wage part of the economy. If everybody were to go to where the high-wage jobs are, which was the cities, there would be so much unemployment that the expected wage of locating in the urban area would be so low that people could do better to leave the urban area and return to the rural area where the expected wage would be higher. As people move out of urban areas, the expected wage in urban areas would rise. And the harris todaro type of equilibrium was where the expected wage associated with an urban search strategy, expected wage associated with a rural search strategy would equal one another. What then if, if one more urban job gets created? An urban job gets created. More than one job seeker would come and try to get the each additional newly created job, and the result would be higher unemployment, not less. That was their insight. And so this idea then of seeing what job search strategies are open to workers, and what the consequences are of people adopting those search strategies, equating expected wages with one search strategy to expected wage associated with another search strategy, and then being able to use the, perturb the model by making policy changes, that's the goal. So three models I want to tell you about in about five minutes each. Okay. The first model is a generic model, not meant to apply to any specific co country, but meant to apply to 
a lot of countries. And the idea of this generic model is that the Harris to Darrow work and other models that preceded it, Harris and Todaro's model had no self employment at all in urban areas. What might be called today informal sector employment in urban areas. Harris and Todaro had simply two sectors high wage urban employment and low wage agricultural employment. Now it's clear that we need to have a self-employment sector that people can enter and enter freely. And uh, the harris Todaro model did not have such a sector. Going back to my own dissertation decades ago, I put one in and used it to do further analysis. But that model itself proved to be unsatisfactory, or incomplete, I should say, in the following sense. It's clear that there are some people who are engaged in self-employment activities because they can get nothing better. It, depending on what you're picturing, you know, which part of the world, when I picture Latin America, I picture people who are street vending and, and selling uh, lottery tickets or chewing gum or whatever it is on the street. When I picture South Asia, I picture people who are selling uh, tomatoes at the side of the road. Or whatever it is it may be, people are not doing that because that's what they aspire to. They're doing that because they can't get anything better. Okay? So clearly that is there. But what is not there is something else that is uh, uh, not there in the models, but is there in the world, is that some people actively choose self-employment in preference to wage employment. They get into wage jobs, some people do, in order to get out of them. That is, uh, and my paradigmatic example of that would be somebody who works in a formal sector uh, automobile repair shop. It's very good at repairing automobiles, has the human capital, saves up the financial capital to buy tools in order to then become a backyard auto mechanic. And this is a person who does so because he believes that he will get higher utility and probably higher income if he does so, if he becomes self-employed. There's therefore an upper tier of self-employment, and there's a free entry tier of self-employment. And where is wage employment? It's in between the two. So for this kind of person, being an auto mechanic in the Ford Motor Garage is better than selling stuff on the street and better than being, self, being unemployed and worse than being self-employed and running one's own auto backyard auto mechanic shop. Okay? So I, what I was just doing with my hands was I had four levels. I had wage employment, free entry self-employment, unemployment, and upper tier uh, self-employment. Four sectors, how do people move around in them. In work that uh, I'm trying to finalize with Ravi Kanbur, Nancy Chow, Arnab Basu, uh, all who are colleagues of mine at Cornell University, what we're doing is we're trying to build a multi-sector model that has these features that I've just described, these four sectors, the movements of people from one to another in them. And the model incorporates three heterogeneities that had not been there previously. One was the one I already mentioned about two kinds of free entry, self, two kinds of uh, self-employment. Free entry at the bottom and upper tier self-employment requiring human and financial capital at the top. Second heterogeneity had to do with people's ability to be entrepreneurs. Some people are very entrepreneurial. I'm not one of them. And so uh, to the extent that there are people who want to get into wage employment in order to remain in wage employment, that's one motivation that may differ from people who get into wage employment in order to learn how to do it in order to then become entrepreneurs and set up their own businesses. And those are different types of people. They have different Kinds of, kinds of skills. And then the third heterogeneity that we were building into the model, uh, besides having people who differ in terms of their ability and these two uh, different 
free entry sectors was people who differ in terms of their ability to search and to acquire new jobs. So building on that then, what we did is we constructed a, a, a model that could be used in order to add to the kinds of uh, insights that could be gotten by doing policy analysis of various kinds. Now, what we concluded from that model, uh, okay, so I see the papers coming around right now. Uh, the, uh, what we concluded from that model was that the original harris todaro conclusion was not borne out by what we saw in, uh, what we deduced in the model. In harris todaros world, each time you create one more high-paying job, you, uh, you create more than one additional unemployed person. Here we have a non monotonicity. You can see it uh, when you get the paper. Uh, you, you can see what happens to unemployment in terms of uh, in, in, in figure 2A. And what that picture shows is that as you create more wage jobs, which are going from left to right, the amount of unemployment, which is on the vertical axis, is going up and then down and then up and then down. It's clearly non-monotonic. And the reasons for the non-monotonicity have to do with the people. I said before there was heterogeneity in terms of job search. Young people and old people are doing separate things. There are two generations in the model. And the, uh, the result is that sometimes creating more employment creates more unemployment, sometimes it doesn't. And, that's one, and, and when it does and when it doesn't, I don't have time to go, uh, to go through here. OK, that's one generic model. Uh, this model has some features that could be applied to any country. Some countries have specific features that require their own specific models. And I'm going to talk in the remaining time about a model for India, a model for China. And these models are different from each other. And I want to uh, tell you about the kinds of analysis that we conducted. The India model builds on a feature of India, not true only of India, but, it is, but India is a paradigmatic case of a country that is highly agricultural, and agriculture is highly seasonal. And so any labor market analysis of India, any thorough labor, I shouldn't say any analysis, any thorough labor market analysis of India would need to take account of seasonality. So the way we uh, uh, did this, uh, Kalyani Raghunathan, a, a Cornell PhD of uh, earlier this year and I, the way that we did that was to say that agriculture itself is seasonal. And so we want to have a two-season model in which we have a slack season followed by a peak season. Slack season would be where uh, there's little agricultural activity going on. But there are people who are trying to earn money in the labor market during that slack season. So what do they do? Some of them migrate, and they leave the rural area. They go off to the city. The city may be thousands of kilometers away. They go for the slack season and do construction work or whatever it is they can get. And then they return uh, during the peak season. Some people do that. What some people do during the slack season is they do slack season activities that might make their land more productive, such as weeding and uh, repairing irrigation uh, ditches and other sorts of activities that make it so that in the peak season, the land will be more productive and they will earn a higher income. So building in that seasonality into an economy that is, has both rural and, and urban segments, what we have are a number of labor market states. In rural areas, people can engage in agriculture 
or, uh, or, or not. In urban areas, three levels of employment. Entry level, uh, free entry employment. Two job categories above that, which we call office workers and we call managers. And clearly, education is required for some of those occupations and not required for others. So that the result is then that there will be, uh, th there, there will be um, a certain amount of activity taking place. I think I have until 9.35, you said? Yeah, OK. I'm watching the clock carefully. <laughs> OK. Uh, all right. Now, then we have people who are making decisions about what to do. And their decision about what to do depends on the returns they get from uh, staying in the rural area, working on the land, uh, improving conditions there, or going off to the city, earning something in the slack season, then returning in the peak season. That's what the India model uh, includes. Now we introduce a policy. A policy is something that India put into effect, the National Rural Employment Guarantee Act. The National Rural Employment Guarantee Act is a, a guarantee to every rural household of 100 days of work uh, in a year. And so if there's a peak season and a slack season, it's not surprising that people make their uh, want uh, jobs from the NREGA in the slack agricultural season. And in the peak season, they're cultivating their own land. So the introducing this, act, this available activity then changes what the equilibrium is going to look like in the labor market and uh, induces people to uh, engage in NREGA work as opposed to uh, improving their land. Now, not improving their land has cost. And maybe uh, it makes it so that the land doesn't yield as much output, yield as much employment in the slacks in the peak season of the year because not as much weeding, not as much uh, irrigation, uh, and so on. Uh, irrigation uh, canal fixing took place in the slack season of the year. So these are the kinds of issues that one could look at and deduce that, as we did, that the effect of introducing an NREGA on workers' well-being is theoretically ambiguous. It depends on how much gain there is to workers' well-being by earning more in the peak season and how much loss there is by not earning in the slack season. Uh, not, 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 I'm sorry, by not uh, working the land in the slack season. OK, the third and last model I want to talk about is a China-specific model, which is the one that is most relevant to uh, the papers that we've been hearing at this conference. This is work done with uh, Yang Song, who is another recent Cornell PhD. He is uh, on the faculty at Renmin University of China. And the Chinese labor market model begins essentially with rural urban differences and the Hukou system. And we've heard enough at this conference. Uh, I don't have to say anything about what the Hukou system does uh, or how it works just to say that it is a very China-specific institution. And we tried to model it in uh, some quite specific ways. Uh, that is, that when workers with rural hukou leave the rural area and go to the urban area, they incur additional costs. And they would have to pay for education, housing, health care, other sorts of things that they wouldn't if they, if they stayed put. Now, uh, a question arose, I think it was in, during your presentation yesterday, Chris, about whether it was uh, that when rural workers go to urban areas, they have less human capital or whether they're discriminated against in urban areas. And our model builds both of them in and says that uh, in both ways, rural workers are disadvantaged when they go to cities. But why do they go to cities? Because earning opportunities are maybe better for them in cities than they are in rural areas. And so people are deciding then on the basis of what they would get if they were to move, what the advantages to them are. In this model, as in the other models, 
the advantage to any one person moving and relocating or searching for a different kind of job is not just determined by that person's own decision, but it's determined by everybody else's decisions. That is to say that uh, it, whether it's the probability of employment, whether it is the wage that prevails in the labor market, it's not just a function of what you do, it's a function of what other people do. These are sometimes called Schelling models, named after Tom Schelling, who uh, wrote a book, uh, Macro Motives and Micro Behavior. Macro motives and micro behavior, if you're not familiar with, uh, with this idea, is that identical agents can choose to do different things because of what the aggregate, mar aggregate, aggregate conditions are for each person. Let me give you two examples. Suppose you're here in Hong Kong. You're trying to get from one place to another. There are two ways to get there, uh, a bridge or a tunnel. Okay. Uh, now, the equilibrium for people getting from one side of the water to the other would be where, however long it takes to go on the bridge, it would take just as long to go on the tunnel in equilibrium. Right? Of course, we may be out of equilibrium for a given amount of time, but the nature of the equilibrium would be that people would, uh, the disequilibrium would be that people would learn we could get there faster if we go this way rather than that way. But if lots of people start going on the one that's faster, it's not going to be faster anymore. And the equilibrium would be that they too would be equally fast or equally slow. That would be where identical agents who don't care whether they take the bridge or the tunnel would, some of them would take the bridge, some of them would take the tunnel, and the equilibrium would be half doing each one. Okay? Now, that is, uh, that's an interior equilibrium in a shelling type model. A, a corner solution would be whatever it is that we do, it pays for all of us to do the same thing. In my country, we all drive down the road on the right. In this country, people all drive down the road on the left. It doesn't matter whether in the beginning uh, somebody decided let's all drive on the right or let's all drive on the left. What matters is now that everybody's driving on one side or the other side, it pays each of us to drive down the same side of the road that everybody else is and not to be uh, uh, driving on the wrong side of the road and uh, causing accidents. So those mo these models then have as, their feature, as a feature that what we do as individuals, our micro motives, depend on the macro behavior of everybody else. Yes? OK, so here's then what I want to leave you with. What I want to leave you with is that in formulating labor market models, the challenges are, how, what are the key sectors to identify? How, does, how do each of the key sectors work? How do, the key, how do these sectors link to one another through job search strategies and through other types of behavior? There is no one single model that would fit India or China or Latin America or any place else. There's a multiplicity of such models. And I think it would be very helpful for us as we proceed to try to develop models that are as both realistic and comprehensive and tractable as we possibly can. Thank you very much. As you can uh, imagine, not an easy paper to discuss <laughs> given the information that, that we have. Now, let me just briefly say the way I see <coughs> Uh, Gary's discussion is that he laid out some of the um, principles and some of the b main models that um, uh, were formulated, uh, say, in the previous generation, which are now b being adapted to the study of um, developing uh, countries. And then uh, he outlined um, briefly uh, two or three models that uh, he and Cortos are working uh, with. In a sense, before I say anything, <coughs> That I, excuse <coughs> me. That um, I mean, the, the only thing I say is that is that we. I, I wish I had more information on the structure of the models that you discuss for countries, especially on the China one, given the, the interest of the group here. So we could comment more about that. But uh, on the basis of the information we have, the model doesn't sound different from. <coughs> 
the one that we presented, or <coughs> excuse me, or the one that, um, or the type that uh, were presented before, except for one comment that I wish to make later on. But let me go back to um, the, um, the the sort of bulk of the discussion, which is the general principles underlying modeling in developing countries. Well, first of all, the question of who benefits from economic growth. Well, of course, there is no doubt that that's an, an important question. In fact, currently, the question is probably more important in developing countries than than in, um, in, in the answer on the transition to development, in the sense that um, that inequality is increasing, and 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 you know the question of who benefits from economic growth, we can also put in a way of a, a sort of a study of inequality, and I think it's the one great big gap in our knowledge that we don't really know how to analyze inequality, we don't know how to deal with it. In um, some countries, redistribution is regarded as a very good policy, and if a politician says that. Uh, she will redistribute, then she gets elected in the United States. If a politician says she will redistribute, then you might as well forget politics. You know, it's, it, it, there are countries that are apparently similar. You know, like look at the United States and uh, Canada, for example, United States and Scandinavia, and you see big contrasts despite that. So, and, and the same applies throughout uh, the the world. The only difference with developing countries is that the the re where the question of who benefits from economic growth is addressed in terms of sectors of the economy. And that's where Gary put most of the emphasis in, the, in his discussion in that uh, th there might be an urban sector and the rural sector and only the urban sector benefits from economic growth and not the rural. And then you need to study the, the connections between the two sectors to see how um, the uh, rural sector will, will benefit. That's how I see it, which I agree, it, it's an important question, and we, you know, it's, it's what we, we did as well, in that uh, we're saying that there's economic growth, the urban sector, the industrial sector benefits from new technology and economic growth, and then what links the rural sector to the urban sector is the migration, and then look at what determines the migration flows and the migration restrictions. I mean, I, I agree with that entirely. I mean, what I say is that, I, is that I wish I had more details about the China model to see how where it differs from what we had so far and what new insights it offers. The shelling model that you've outlined, I mean, I don't know, in the way that you've outlined it, I, I, I don't think it does very much actually for this kind of study, but, um, but I reserve judgment in a way to see if there is anything more to it. I mean, the, <clears throat> the way I see that issue is that, is that as a way of of allocating resources when you have many different allocations and you need to avoid overcrowding in, in, in one direction and, and not the other. But uh, why, why is that relevant for China, for example? I don't know. <laughs> maybe, maybe, we can, maybe you can tell us more. I, I also think that that's, that, that, my, that the doubts I'm expressing about that are probably the same ones as the ones that you expressed about the Harris Todaro model in that why is it the case that uh, urban development makes the situation worse, I really cannot see it. I mean, maybe when Harris Tudara were writing in Kenya, it was relevant, but today the issue about moving to the city as opposed to staying in the country is not unemployment. Unemployment is not the constraint. Even in, um, I mean, you know, and, and, if, and if I'm saying it, you can see that I became convinced that it took, it, it wasn't easy to convince me that unemployment wasn't the constraint because even uh, in, um, even in Latin America, when I first my first visits in Latin America, which were probably ten years ago, and I was saying to them how reg the regulations they have might lead to unemployment, and you have two sector models: unemployment and employment. And they said to me, "No, no, this is irrelevant. The, what's relevant for Latin America is the informal sector that is due by. So if you are if you are going to have a two sector model, you should have one of the formal economy and the informal economy." Um, unemployment is a third sector that is less important, you know. But if you look at uh, Western Europe, for example, then unemployment is the, or, or the United States, for that matter, unemployment is the second sector. Now the reason, now that, if if you say then say if we have the two sector Harris to Dara type models, what are they? Well, if you look at the, the situation of China, for example, and the, and the two sector models that we had here, the relevant constraints on the urban in urban mi migration uh, are two, the ones that practically everyone here. The first one is the, is the higher cost of living in the city, especially housing costs and the extent to which a rural worker can um, um, 
as, as it were, um, deal with those and, and incorporate them into his maximization calculus. And, um, and that's where all the land use and all that comes in. Uh, and the second one is the technology transfer, whether the skills and the human capital that you have in the countryside can be transferred to the urban economy. Uh, and the answer is that in many cases it cannot, or if you use, in fact, the Roy model is more relevant actually here, and it's, I'm surprised you didn't mention it at all, but there you go. And, um, and then whether those skills can be used, and although with the first few migrants they might be able to use their skills, eventually you hit constraints in that there are people who might be very good at cultiva cultivating the land and telling the difference between different types of soil, but it won't help them very much when they go into a, a factory with robotics. You know that that's that's the idea. It's it so the so the constraint and and whether that section of the labor force can benefit from economic growth. I wouldn't think it depends on anything Harris Todaro mentioned or, or even knew at the time. I, they were not, not blaming for not knowing you know, who could have guessed what technology would have been or information. And, then, and of course, it's also the information transfer that deals with the shelling problem and the, with the unemployment overcrowding problem. All right, now about informal self employment. Well, it was seven, well I, again, I mean, here I don't know if, I don't know much about China actually in the informal economy, I have to confess. but. I did study a little bit the situation in Latin America because of the regulations they have, especially Colombia and, and to a lesser extent Peru, only because of a recent visit there. Um, and um, and what the informal economy is there is it's not self-employment, whether people prefer to be self-employed, even if they don't report rather than work for someone else. It's more the regulation that determines the informal economy. Um, especially the very high minimum wages that they have. I mean, like Colombia has a minimum wage which is about 70 percent. It's between 65 and 70 percent of the median wage. Well, when you have that, obviously the economy cannot work in, in a because you do have complementarities between skills. As someone mentioned yesterday, you need to employ unskilled workers. And if you have to employ them at 70 percent of the median wage, the, the labor market will break down. So the way you avoid that is by creating a huge informal sector, and the economy, and sorry, and the policymakers simply turn a blind eye to the informal sector. Now that's not good for the economy, of course, but but it's a cost of the of the regulation. And these are employees; they are not even self-employed. Most of them, you know, they are small and medium-sized enterprises in um, <coughs> in Colombia and, and and Peru, actually, from what I was told a couple of weeks ago. Uh, when uh, we were there, almost no SME is registered in the formal sector of the economy. They don't; they are unregistered. They don't pay taxes. They don't register their workers. They just operate as a completely free, capitalized, decentralized economy. <coughs> but again, the choice is not the one because between the do I work for someone else or do I work for myself. The choice is. Do I comply with these uh, crazy regulations that they inherited from the Spanish <laughs> over there uh, and the Italians to some extent? Or do I go my own way and, and set up the business the way I want and run it the way I want and hopefully uh, the lawmakers will not um, take any notice of me, which is what's happening. <coughs> I, d I doubt whether that is the case in China. In fact, I know it isn't from my visit to, the, uh, to, to China. Uh, frequent now, the the model though that is relevant to China, from what <coughs> I hear, is the um, is the seasonal model, um, and especially to um, especially in the in intra-regional migration, which uh, which was discussed uh, yesterday, as to what's the difference between intra-regional migration and inter-regional migration. I think one of the differences is the is the um, ability to return to the land at, at small cost when there is seasonal work, and that and that's partly why the um, uh, return to labor for the intra-regional migration people is higher than the inter-regional ones, and in fact that it, it's it's relevant to what to the statistics that many people have used as well because. If you have, which is something that Gary didn't mention, but I suspect is also true in, in in India, which is the case that if you have um, 
if you have a worker, I mean, I mean, take, I mean, take a family that is living in the village in in China, and then a member of the family take the, say say the, uh, the the husband moves to the city to the urban location to work in industry, and when at harvest time, when there is a lot of work in the land, he goes back to the land to work as an agricultural worker for two months of the year, and then comes back to the city. Then, when that person is asked in the survey, "What job do you have?" he will mention the city job because that's primary employment. So there is a lot of unreported labour in the in, in agriculture, uh, our unreported hours of work, if you like, labour, which is due to the fact that it's a second job uh, to these people. But but because they can, because they are within um, easy access of their land, they retain it. They don't lose it. The family cultivates it, and in fact. He cultivates it. It's just that they allocate their time separately, and I th and I think that is relevant to the um, <clears throat> to the way we measure the statistics. You know, if that if that's non-trivial in China, then the agricultural labor is a lot more than what we have in the statistics, which is partly driven by the regulation of the of, of the hukou system that they want to get hold of the land and not give it up uh, because it won't be easy to. Get it back. So these are the comments I had. In fact, I've t amazingly, I've t spoken for twelve minutes instead of five. <laughs> so, are there any any, any questions? I thought I would speak for two minutes, actually, given what the notes I was scribbling down. So I'm sorry that I exceeded my time. There was no chairman to give me w time warnings. <laughs> um, so, are there any questions that you might have? And then I'll give you back the floor. <clears throat> yeah. Let me be, be very brief so that we don't cut into the, the next, this next session. Chris and Lauren, I thank you both for your comments. Uh, I suspect that uh, in deciding to make the presentation I just did, that I may have made a mistake in terms of not presenting uh, the specific equations for any one of the three models. And I, uh, so what I wanted to, to, to just say is that there are papers associated with all of them and uh, that they, 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 are, they are 
available to anyone who would want them. What, what our strategy has been is just simply to try to capture as many of those features, Lauren, that, that, uh, as, as possible. Uh, and to the ex that's why I have co-authors who are specialists in those countries. And to the extent that there are things that we, that we left out and that we need to include, great. That opens up a new, a new opportunity for everybody else to contribute to those sorts of models. And so, uh, Chris, I thank you for, for your comments. I'll try to be uh, 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 to share, share some of that information with you. And thank you, and thank you, everybody, for listening.